Let's pray and then we'll, we'll jump in. Father, we're so grateful once again that we can come before you, that we can call upon your great name. Lord, that we have your word with us. Lord, give us grace now to receive your word, all you have to say. Help me in, in teaching the truth. Lord, give grace and wisdom and understanding. Lord, minister to all of our hearts through your word. We look to you with thanksgiving and with joy this morning. We praise you and love you and, and ask you to bless us now in the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Back in Hebrews 8, today I'm going to focus on really verses 6 and 7, but I'm going to read the first seven verses to start us off here. So Hebrews 8, 1 through 7. He says, now the point in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Amen. Well, the author had expressed like a good teacher his main point of the argument there in, in chapter eight, verses one and two. He brings it in. This is the point. This is the main point of what I'm talking about. We have such a high priest, one who is seated, one who is at the ultimate position of authority and majesty and sovereignty over all. He's there and it's in the true tent in heaven. And the flow of this whole teaching comes from what, the, what King David had written and was inspired to write in Psalm 110. A very pivotal and important psalm. And this regards the priest, the eternal priest king to come. And he shows, the Hebrew author shows how the, the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the promise, the word of the oath, which was from Psalm 110, that's where the oath came from. The word of the oath appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. He is the perfect high priest. He's made perfect through his perfect life and through his suffering and death. What he has experienced on our behalf, he's the perfect high priest. And so we have this contrast of weak and imperfect from the law and man. And then we have the, the powerful and the perfect that came from the promise and from the son of God. Now, Moses was told by God to make the tent or yeah, make the tent, the, the tabernacle in the wilderness exactly as God had instructed him. He had told them specifically, and he, and he says he told them almost like it was a warning. You better be careful, you do this right. And, and that's what he did. So he was on the mountain when he got those instructions, which was Mount Sinai, remember? After he had led the people, people out in the Exodus, out of Egypt, they, they come to this great mountain and this is where the law came and God spoke to Moses, gave him these instructions. And so Moses didn't just make all this stuff up, did he? This is not some man-made religion. This is something that came from God through him and it was a real covenant that was made through Moses. And everything that comes from God is good. We wanna get that in mind, everything. Everything God does, everything that comes from him is good. 
Whether we see it or not, or feel it or not, or experience it or not, always, it is good because he's good. So Moses was used in establishing these shadows and these copies of the heavenly things, the heavenly realities. So you have heavenly versus earthly also. You see that through this passage, the heavenly ministry of the priest versus the earthly ministry of the old priests. Now, verse six tells us, he says, but as it is, this is our focus today, verses six and seven. I just didn't feel like rushing all the way into the next part. I want us to get this part clear in our minds as best as we can. He says, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Okay, so that verse right there, that verse six, it really closes the argument, this long argument that the author had been developing and working through that Christ surpasses the old Levitical priesthood. So he's summing that up. And we've seen that he brought in this better law. He brought in a better hope in this earlier passage and a better covenant. He'd already mentioned that in verse 22 in chapter seven. He, he's the guarantor of a better covenant. But he says, but as it is, or some translate it, but now. See, Christ's ministry is now. Moses' ministry and covenant was then, and it's past and it's over. But as it is, now, present, but now, this is the way it is. Christ is the minister of the new covenant and, and the high priest. So compared with the ministry that Moses was given, Christ has obtained from God a much more excellent ministry between God and man. We're told right there, much more excellent. And he spoke of this some already in chapter three, Moses being a faithful servant. Remember that picture? In the household of God, he was a faithful servant. But Christ is the son over the household. A whole entire difference in servant versus son in a household. Well, the word obtained here, you notice that word, it's, it's in the perfect tense. You know, usually we have past tense, present tense, and future tense. Well, there's also a perfect tense, meaning, most of you probably know what this means, but it means it's forever. It, it means that he has attained this position for all time. He possesses it now, right now, as we're sitting in this room, in these chairs, He holds this ministry in heaven right where he is. He possesses it forever, for all time. And it wasn't that that way with Moses. It was never intended to be that way with Moses. Moses was never supposed to be the final mediator between God and mankind, nor, nor God's covenant with Moses. It wasn't meant to last forever. We'll see later, it was meant to grow old and go away. But this is something the Jews, they had a real problem with this, calling it, you know, an old covenant or or that that this covenant with Moses wasn't going to last forever. And Jesus would even say things to them because they would argue with him about this. And he would say things like, listen, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Why? Because he wrote about me. Now, for, for someone who's from the Jewish religion and Hebrews, to say a statement like that was really off the charts, almost beyond the pale. Moses wrote about you, and that's right, that's what we have been seeing, that's what we've been saying, the tabernacle, the curtain, the offerings, the, the altar, all of it is about me. It's all about Christ. Moses' ministry and his role as, as the mediator of that covenant was very temporary, but the Lord's, the Lord Christ, his, his role in mediator is forever. It's forever and ever, and that's just what he's moving into. His mediatorship is forever. You remember what the Apostle Paul said in 1, 1 Timothy 2, 5? He said, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the one mediator. 
So here we see one thing that makes this covenant better, and it's the promises. What makes it better is he says there are better promises. I love the betters throughout Hebrews. I think there's 11 or 12 of them. And you know, like I said, we had heard about the better hope and the better covenant now, but here's what makes the covenant better, it's the better promises. Now the, the author doesn't elaborate exactly on what these promises are at this point, but we can see from the flow, from the context, we can understand that according to that, it has to do with the activity of the priesthood, his priesthood on behalf of mankind. Remember, no one on earth will be saved apart from the priestly ministry of Christ. He has to mediate for you, for you to be saved. And this is what he does. And in this letter from chapter five, five verse one, really through most of chapter 10, this, this is presenting to us the central theological argument of the entire letter. And it's about redemptive sacrifice. Chapter five through most of chapter 10, this is what the whole letter is mostly about. That's the most important theme. And it's this, it's that redemptive sacrifice and how Christ has secured it for us. He secured an eternal redemption for us. So the better promises will also unfold later in in chapter eight when he starts talking about the law of God being written on our hearts and on our minds and God's not gonna remember our sins anymore. What precious promises and realities. He'll move into that. So we'll talk about that more when we get there. But what I want us to understand and and learn about or even sharpen ourselves with is this this reality of, of promises have to do with covenant. Covenant. So I want us to think about the importance or the aspects of covenant. So what is a covenant? I mean, this is pretty common terms for most of us. The most, most covenants we're familiar with today would be the covenant of marriage. You make that commitment, it's, it's forever, till death do us part, you, you, to love and all, and all this stuff. You make other kind of agreements or covenants, contracts with purchasing a home or things like that. There are various things, but biblically, what is a covenant and why is that important? That's what we're focusing on primarily today. So by definition, Biblically, a covenant is an unchangeable, divinely imposed legal agreement between God and man that stipulates the conditions of their relationship. That's it in a nutshell. It's an unchangeable, divinely imposed. This is coming from heaven. Legal agreement. This is lawful, legal, and binding between God and man, and it stipulates the conditions of their relationship. So God deals with us by way of covenant. And he in his great mercy and compassion and pity, he has chosen to deal with fallen mankind, fallen humanity, but it's gonna be by way of covenant. And it's for a few reasons. Because he's talking about in the definition, this agreement between God and man, it, it stipulates conditions. Like God's not just gonna deal with fallen mankind at willy-nilly or out of whim or just because. No, he's gonna have some stipulations. And there's a few reasons. And, and one reason is that God cannot abide or be in communion with anyone who has sin in their life, who is sinful and, and unforgiven sin. It, he cannot do it and will not do it. It is, it is judgment, it is fury, it is wrath against sin. That, that for him to dwell with us, he won't do it. We, and, and, and there must be this atonement or purification made before, before that. So there, there's a kind of a twofold problem there. Number one, he won't dwell with you or have anything to do with you apart from judgment and fury while you have sin in your life, unforgiven. Number two, you got a problem because you love sin. As long as you love and hold on to sin in your own heart, that's another big problem. So that has to be dealt with. Another reason he deals with us by way of covenant is is we can never purge our own sins. 
cannot do it. We cannot earn our own salvation or merit with God. It's impossible. That's one of those impossibles. You know, we cannot ascend to heaven on our own. That's, that's not done. It's not going to be done. I believe some preach, uh, old Puritan preachers would say you'd sooner climb on a rope of sand to the moon before you ascend into heaven on your own. It cannot be done. You know, in fact, every effort, every man-made effort, their best of efforts, to, their, their ta- the best of Tower of Babels, so to speak, they only and always end in confusion. Every time. The best of man's works and achievements will utterly end in confusion. The Tower of Babels fail. So, so that's another reason. Number, and a third reason I have, there could be more, but a third reason God deals with us by way of covenant is we must have God descend to us to save us. Unlike Moses, this is exactly what the mediator of the new covenant has done, what Christ has done. He has come from heaven. He has come down. He has ascended to us. And when we think of these covenants, you know, we don't strike up the deal with God. And we, we hear of that. You know, people get in these conditions and say, I, I made a promise with God. If he'll get me out of this or if he'll help me do this, then I'll be good or I'll, right, I'll do this. That's kind of a man-made covenant right there that initiates with man. Those don't work. That is not what we're talking about. God comes down. He initiates the covenant. And, and he's not obligated to anything outside of what he has promised to us. And that's important because we're dealing with covenant. We're dealing with promise. Promise he has made. And so we can't bargain with God. We got to get rid of that idea forever. We don't bargain with God ever. That never works out. Ever. Read what happened to Jephthah in Judges 11 when he tried to make a bargain. It's always grace. It's always something for nothing. And it's always bound to and under his covenant to you. So God's the one who initiates the covenants and and it's a very gracious, loving thing of him to do that. For him to even do this, even the old covenant, it's it's a gracious, loving act on his part for, for his people to bring that in. And his covenant promises that that he has given, he is free from his heart to answer and help and give every bit of his promises to you. We don't have to like wrench them out of his hands. Like you promise, like you promise to do this. Like you're gonna wrench it out of his hands. No, everything he's promised by way of his covenant, it's, it's yes, from my heart, liberally, abundantly. All the promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. So the author's now in a transition in, in his subject here from the office of the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek and all of that, now he's transitioning to the subject of the new covenant. This is huge. This is, this is a big truth and aspect of Christianity and our salvation is this new covenant. And that means they're, they're, the new covenant implies and means therefore the other covenant is old it's the old covenant and you know the the terms of the old covenant the stipulations and terms of the old covenant were essentially this do this and live obey all that I've commanded you and you will not die right and by the way all the commandments of of of, of that old covenant, which are basically summarized by the Ten Commandments, they're all good, aren't they? Is there one of the Ten Commandments that's not good? Is it good that you honor your parents? Is it good that you tell the truth? Is it good that you only have one God? Yeah, all of these are good. And, and so this is what's coming in. The old covenant had a very important purpose and a function, right, and a reason for it. And it was given to revive and tighten the old covenant of works. Say it again. The old covenant came in through Moses on that mountain to revive 
the covenant of works. Which ought to bring up the question, well, what's the covenant of works? Where was that established? When, when was that? So here's the Mount Sinai, the old covenant through Moses. Now the covenant of works is all the way back here in the Garden of Eden with Adam. Remember, that is the covenant of works. And its stipulations were obey and live. Transgress and die. That's, so, Moses' covenant reaches back and revives that. This is what I was learning. I read a lot of John Owen. I think he just did the best on, on explaining this, at least to me. He revives that. And where the, old, where the covenant of works, it originated with Adam and Eve. So this function of the old covenant is to revive and undergird those covenant of works. It added more definition to it. It, it, it added more of the explanation of it and parameters around it. And in and through that came the law. Does that make sense? It's not just this one tree in the garden. It's if you, if you lie, you die. If you dishonor your parents, you die. If you, if you steal, you die. See, it's adding definition. It's, it's reviving that whole thing. And in, the, in and through that covenant comes the law, the law of God. I hope you see how that works. So the covenant with Moses revived that and added definition and elaborated to it. And the law now is established under it. Well, ever since that original fall in the garden, the greatest need for all of mankind is now to be reconciled to God, to be reconciled to the Father, for heaven and earth to be reconciled. That's the greatest need of mankind. But that reconciliation was never intended to be achieved by man, by way of law keeping. That was never the point. It was never achievable, right? And that's what we see throughout the New Testament. The Apostle Paul preached the gospel in reminding people that by works of the law shall no man be justified. Okay, that's good news. That's very good news. That's gospel. So the old covenant's original intention and design was never to actually make people right with God or save anyone. From Adam until today, not a single person has ever been saved by keeping the law. No one. The law of works. When the law came in through the old covenant, it was never designed to be liberating and life-giving. That wasn't its design or intention. The law doesn't do that. It's legal. It's strict. It's do this and live. If you break this, if you break one part of it, didn't Paul say that in Galatians? If you keep all of it and break one part of it, you die. See how the law, it doesn't give liberty and life and freedom. It doesn't do that. And no one's ever been saved that way. All the way from the beginning until today, no one's ever been saved that way. It's always by grace. So the old covenant, nor the law, has the power or ability to save us, nor can it meet our deepest needs. Your deepest needs will not be fulfilled by your law keeping, your goody goodness. You won't find your ultimate joy in that. You just won't. You can't. Well, the new covenant comes in. The new, new covenant, I talked about the old covenant laying hold of the old covenant of works. Now the new covenant comes in and ho lays hold of the covenant of grace. I'm going to go this way again. Because back here at the covenant of works is also, where was the covenant of grace established? It was also established with Adam and Eve. After they blew it, he chose in his love and kindness to be gracious to mankind. He even slew the... The, the ox and clothed them. Its blood was shed and they were clothed with its, its skin. See that? So he's, he's establishing this covenant of grace. So the new covenant reaches back and lays hold of that and defines and establishes it forever. And it's established in the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this covenant of grace given to Adam and Eve after the fall and all of mankind, it was basically God's promise to be gracious and merciful to all who humble themselves 
and look to him in faith and trust in his promises. So that's, that's the way it's been with everyone from history. Everyone in the world who has ever been saved or ever will be saved, it will ultimately be saved, number one, through the grace and mercy of God. Remember he told Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. And in that mercy of God is in Christ Jesus. He's the savior of all mankind, before the cross and after the cross, always. So this covenant of grace was always the way of life and mercy and salvation, and it was all through Christ. Yet in the new covenant, its actual establishment was in the death of Christ. It was confirmed and established forever when he died on the cross. So so just as that law came down to Moses on Mount Sinai and defined and confirmed and established the covenant of works, the new covenant, it came down and was established and confirmed and defined forever in the death of Christ right there on that cross. When he shed his blood, this high priest, with this better sacrifice, established this new covenant forever. So the, the, this, this is what, when he died on the cross, the substance of it was all defined. The shadows now are, are gone and the substance is here. Now we have true living reality and color and, and understanding what all those shadows and copies were about. It's him. And now we're blessed as a church to have this real fellowship as the new covenant believers and so grace and mercy from God has always been by way of, is the way of salvation for sinners. Grace, mercy. You remember even in Jesus' some of his parables, before the cross, before all that really came to light, he would tell to parables. He would say, you know, there's a tax collector and a Pharisee. The Pharisee's saying, Lord, thank you that I obey all these rules, right? And more. And there's another guy, the tax collector. What was his deal? He was like, Lord, like beating his chest, be merciful to me, a sinner. What was his appeal? The mercy of God. That's the way it always is. It's all it always has been and always will be. You know, when that, ep- that, that time when Moses was on the mountain and he wanted to see God's glory, he said, Lord, show me your glory. And God's saying, no, you can't, you'll die. And he says, what I'll do is I'll, you, you'll hide in the rocks, put you in the cleft of the rocks, I'll put my hand over, and then I'll pass by and you can basically see the very back fringes or, of his glory and majesty, the very, the very back part. But when he did do that, I want us to remember what God said when he passed by. It wasn't the law, the law, keep it, keep it, do right, do right. Listen to what he said. It said, when he passed by, the Lord said, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's who he is. Your salvation comes from him from his mercy and love and faithfulness. Your salvation never will or can come from your law keeping. But we need to understand that these two covenants, really they're two distinct covenants. They're different. There's a new covenant. It's different and new. And this is sometimes, I, I agree, this is sometimes hard to wrestle with and, and gather because there's a lot written about the covenants and covenant theology and all of that and different understandings. But I want to, as best I can, just draw from the text what, what we're seeing here. And it, it is a new covenant. And there is a difference. And, and a few differences I see would be that one covenant causes fear and bondage and holds everyone under the power of death. Isn't that what he said in chapter two? Because the new covenant comes in and it liberates from the fear and power of death. 
One is designed to bind a sense of the curse on our conscience for all mankind. The other is established in Christ to take away the curse and liberates our conscience. He'll talk about that later. He sets your conscience free. All that your conscience is bothering you about, you didn't tell the truth or you didn't honor your parent. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. Your conscience is like, like just bugging you. When you're in Christ, he, he just lets your conscience free. His freedom. Well, one, one is mediated by simply a man. The other is mediated by the Son of God, who, by the way, is the King of heaven, the King of the whole universe, and who is the great high priest. The yoke of one is heavy and unbearable. The yoke of the other is light. See how this goes? One brought in the law, the other brought in grace and truth. One brought dread and terror. When it was inaugurated on that mountain, the people were scared out of their wits. When the thunder is crashing and the lightning flashes and, and they were scared and God even said, keep them back, don't let them near. That was the inauguration of the old covenant. When the new covenant came, when it was inaugurated, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and joy and approach, free approach, access to God. Well, verse seven says, for, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now, because of the fault and weak, weakness that lied in the old covenant, you know, there's now an occasion, a time, a right time to look for a second. And this is what God does. God is gonna find, he's gonna bring in the second the new covenant, God's the one who took action. He's the one who took initiative and he's the one who has perfect timing in it all. If you ask me why he did it that way with the old covenant and, and Israel and all that, the come and see religion versus the go and tell religion now, I don't know. I simply don't know. Uh, there may be some explanations, but we're not giving it here at least. But he initiates this, his timing's perfect in the fullness of time. God sent forth his son to fulfill all righteousness. Now I want us to notice here, it takes God, it takes the sovereign power and authority of God to make this effective. And he did it. It takes the work of God, the God man, to liberate us from the power of sin and the law and its demands on our lives. Because it has demands. And Look at Romans 8 for a minute, because I thought Romans 8 was so pertinent here. If you briefly want to turn there, or you can listen to me, I'll read it. Romans 8, 1 through 4. Listen to this in the context of what, what we've been hearing, what we've been talking about with this new covenant. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, I'm sorry, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. That's what we're talking about, the weakness, the fault. Well, he said he did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I mean, that's the gospel. That's glorious. He's done it. But this does mean that God's holy law cannot be ignored. It cannot be ignored. And, and Jesus' ministry is far superior because it actually is effective in reconciling us to the Father. The law is in the way of you being reconciled to the Father. It's got demands, it's got legal claims. You know, it had to be fulfilled. And nothing of this law could be removed until it was fulfilled, nothing. Every last jot and tittle of the justice of the law of God. You, you, wanna, you better believe God loves justice and his own justice that's under his own law, he won't let one thing pass. 
John Owen said, it's easier to remove heaven and earth than to remove the law as unto its right and title to rule the souls and consciences of men before all was fulfilled. Think of that. It has the right and title to rule your soul and your conscience until it's fulfilled. So this is a problem and it it cannot be ignored. A lot of people think in their foolishness, if I ignore the problem, it'll just eventually go away, right? You know that's the case. At work, I'll set that aside for a while. Maybe it'll go away. Or in a, in a marriage, there's a problem here. Let's just ignore that. Maybe it'll go away. That's how, oper- that's how humans in their fallings operate. But that's not the case with the law. It will not go away. And it must be fulfilled. It, can't, it cannot. No, nothing that God does ever simply goes away. If he establishes this law, it is not going to go away when it is accusing you justly of your sin. And so it takes the power of God to make it go away. And when he says something offends him, we ought to be very careful to take it to heart, to understand what it is that we do or how we live that offends him. So two things are required for guilty sinners that the law demands. Number one is the perfect fulfilling of the law's righteousness. It's got to be fulfilled. And if it isn't, those that break the law bring in number two. The law is broken. Number two that it demands is that the curse of it must be undergone. You break the law, the curse that is behind that must be undergone, has to be, absolutely must. So here's where the gospel comes in. Here, the, the author of our salvation, our champion, the pioneer, him, the guarantor of the new covenant has fulfilled both of these things for us. In his perfect life, in, in everything, he obeyed the law perfectly. So right there, Demand number one is met. His perfect life in righteous, met the righteous requirements of the law. It's met all in him. Well, what about number two? In his death on the cross, his shedding of his blood, the curse of the law was fulfilled in him. It's all in him. He became a curse for us. He who knew no sin became sin. You see that? And he did it for us. This is our mediator. We have to have a mediator. This is our mediator between God and man. He's the one who truly reconciles us to God. He's fulfilled the law. He's he's fulfilled the two main requirements of the law for us. The law's sanctions and demands. Because of that, God declares them void and, and over. They're gone. For you who trust my son, you're justified. Those are over. No more demands of the law. No more awful curse hangs on you. Isn't that good news? When the Lord Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave, that old covenant was officially over. It's done. And it is hereby now forever expired. That's why he's telling the Hebrews you cannot go back to that. You will die. You're crucifying the Son of God anew by doing that. You cannot go back. It's death. It's the way of death. You can't. It's, it's forward. It's hold fast to your confession in Christ, in this new covenant that's been established. See, this is about the saving work of Christ. Hebrews lays it out very clearly, more clearly than almost any New Test- Testament letter, the saving work of Christ tells us what he did, how he did it, more more elaborately here, especially in chapter 5 through 10. And it's the author's argument. There's salvation nowhere else but in him. He has actually achieved what the old covenant high priests only foreshadowed and didn't really achieve anything. He actually achieved it. 
So that's what makes his ministry better and superior is because he is effective. They, they weren't and couldn't be. So our mediator doesn't just show up in the holiest of holies once a year with a rope tied around his leg, right? He lives there. He's enthroned there, seated as the king at the right hand of the majesty of God. He's, he's with God and he is our reconciliation to God. He has reconciled man with God forever in his person. He's taken on our flesh and nature. He is by nature God, the Son. It's all reconciled in him. The old covenant was weak and, and even being able to keep people in the covenant, right? I mean, they were departing and breaking the covenant left and right to where God finally said, we'll see later, I have no regard for them. And that was because of sin. You know, they were, they were, they were unbelieving and sinful and they, they hardened their hearts where he said, don't do like them and harden your heart against this new covenant promise in this great mediator whom angels worship. Don't do that. Well, the new covenant is brought in by this new mediator. The old covenant was mediated by Moses. The new covenant is mediated by Christ. Moses and technically the priesthood with him. Aaron and the priesthood, Moses was mediating this old covenant. Now the new one's in Christ. And you think about the two different mediators a little bit. You can see, I mean, Moses was faithful, but he, he wasn't flawless. At the very start, he didn't want to do it. Remember that? He's like, please send someone else. The burning bush, send someone else. I can't do it. I can't speak well. They're not going to believe me. All of this. He gave le- several reasons. I don't want to. <laughs> and so he, and, and even when he was in it, in the midst of it, he, God used him to deliver Israel. They're in the wilderness. He had his moments. He would be like, he'd be going to God about, these people are horrible. <laughs> and, and then he would, even that moment, he struck the rock that was to give life and, and, and to the people. He struck that rock. God said, you did not regard me as holy among the people. See, I'm not putting Moses down. This is biblical truth. And when the comparison to the new mediator, you don't, give a, you don't get a hint of any of that, right? You look at Philippians 2, what that tells you about who, how in his condescending mercy and love, he came freely, willingly. It's more of the attitude of, Send me. See how different, how much better, what a perfect savior and mediator we have in Christ. He sympathizes with us perfectly. He sympathizes with you tenderly. He didn't go to God and say, they're, they're horrible. <laughs> I can't deal with these people. He goes to God with a sympathetic heart saying, I know what it's like and I'm ready to help them. I'm ready to give mercy. I'm ready to give grace to help them. And this is what we have. This is who we have. He loves us perfectly. He died for us. Moses did not die for the people. He died for us. We'll see more of this later. Owen says, the the administration of the new covenant is extended unto all nations under heaven, none being excluded on the account of race, language, family, nation, or place of habitation, all have an equal interest in the rising sun. Do you love that? That sun comes up in the morning, everyone on the earth has an equal interest in that sun, doing what only it can do. The gates, the partition wall is broken down, the gates of the new Jerusalem are set open unto all comers in the gospel dispensation. Well, at the end, he summarizes that at chapter six and seven. He's now ended his topic on the priesthood and he's moving into this new covenant realities and what Christ has done in the new covenant. And the prophet Jeremiah will be quoted next time. Amen. Father, we love you and I ask you to bless this to your people. 
even the imperfect way, no doubt, I have delivered it. Take the truth, apply it to your people's hearts for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen.